Ladies and gentlemen, please, um, now we move straight to a panel discussion where we now look at the book, but also the personalities that were involved in the collection of these untold stories that have come to shape up the book that is going to redefine leadership in Africa. Please, Taka, would you take your seat there as a, the senior, uh, the lead on the panel? Please take your seat right there for me on my left, the very first seat on the left, yes. Allow me to introduce, these persons are part of the collection process, so yes, please allow me to introduce um, Mr. Justice Emil Short, who is the Ghanaian judge and served as the first commissioner of Ghana's Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice from 1993 to 2004. Please, let's put our hands together for Justice Emil Short. Please, you sit next to Mr. Wari. To join them, ladies and gentlemen, is also currently the external advisor to the EU 2020 Negative Emissions uh, Project, a consortium of 16 institutions across uh, Europe exploring negative emissions technology and practices, as well as scalability pathways. Please, let's put our hands together for Pauline Anneman, please. Last but not the least on the panel is a gentleman who needs no introduction at all. His voice is heard all over Africa and in some parts of Europe as he is the main anchor to the morning show, which is the biggest morning show now. I speak in authority of City FM, which is the City Breakfast Show. He's a media personality and a broadcast journalist and ace one for that matter. And he speaks on matters concerning leadership, economics, business, and anything else you can decide on a social platform. Please let's put our hands together nicely for Mr. Bernard Avle. Before we get to the conversation, there are two more personalities. Allow me to introduce them who form part of the collection process but will not be joining the panel. Um, this fine gentleman is a Ghanaian academic and he's a professor in the field of law and has served in various universities in Ghana and abroad. He is a former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana and also former president of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please, Professor Akila Pasoya. Although I haven't seen her here yet, she is a lawyer, a gender activist, and also the executive director of the ARC Foundation, an NGO in Ghana, which established the first shelter for battered women in Ghana in 1999 and offers advocacy and psychosocial support to women and children. Please, Madam Angela Draminabwaje, please. At this point, I hand over the microphone to Taka, and the panel conversation can begin. Thank you so much. So I think Atu has introduced the amazing five Ghanaians I interviewed for the book. And as I mentioned, I could have gone much, much further because there were so many more. So it was a tough choice, eh? but I'm so excited and I really want to thank all five of them. Um, Angela's actually out of the country. That's why she's not here today. But for the four that are here, I really want to thank you for sharing your story so openly with me. Eh? So I have just a few questions for each of you, quite related to the stories that you've shared in the book. So, Justice Emil Short. In, in the book, one of the principles that leaders have to apply, and one of the principles I share, is that of challenging the status quo and seeking transformation. In other words, I write in the book that leadership is about change. And I often say that if you're leading, but you're not bringing about change, you may simply be managing. You're not leading. The problem is when you're seeking to bring about change, you will meet resistance and come up against the powers that be. Justice Short, I used one of your stories as an example of what it means to be courageous enough to withstand the resistance and personal attacks a leader may face while leading change. 
And I'm not telling you all the story. You have to read the book to hear the story. Yeah? So as a former Ghana commissioner of Straj, you sometimes had to stand alone for your values and for a higher purpose that you were trying to achieve. My question to you is this. What would you say to a leader who is afraid of the consequences and fallout of leading change in terms of the personal attacks and pushbacks? How does a leader prepare for and cope with that? Professor, doctor. <laughs> Taka, I worry. Anytime I call her, that's how I address her. Because she's an academic of the highest order, and I, I, I never, I'm, I'm always amazed at her intellect, at her articulation. So before I answer your question, I just like to say that uh, I met Taka as a member of a board of uh, one of the NGOs, West African Civil Society Initiative. And um, her, her contribution was always straight to the point, very highly intellectual. And, <laughs> and so it's really a pleasure and a privilege for me to be part of this, this event. And also I feel extremely humbled that you have included me in your book because um, I never felt that I, I deserve to be considered, <laughs> you know, one of your choices as leaders. But anyway, I, to answer your question, um, I think a lot depends on one's upbringing. If you are going to stand for what you believe in and you are going to you are going to assert the values and the norms which you believe in then you must have that, that kind of courage that kind of dedication and commitment to what you believe in and so no matter what obstacle comes in your way you know I believe that you have to be able to stand for what you believe in and the values that you stand for. And um, when I, I don't, I'm not an expert on leadership, but I, I, I exercised leadership in when I was um, the commissioner for the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice from 1993 to 20. Uh, 10. And it was uh, during a very difficult period because we had just transited from military rule to constitutional rule and democracy. And it wasn't easy trying to navigate the journey, you know. Um, and I had so many challenges. Most of those of you who were familiar with my time at Shraj uh, would remember some of the difficulties I had investigating ministers of the topmost, you know, rank for allegations of uh, corruption and, and um, embezzlement, and so. It was a very diff it was a very challenging period of my life, um, but I was determined because of my upbringing, thanks to my dad who instilled certain values in all his children, values of integrity, values of um, contentment, and and so during that period, I stood up against a lot of um, animosity. And um, I did not even realize what people saw in what I was doing. 
but because this was just part of me. And so I think it all depends on the values that you, you, you are brought up with and uh, the ability to stand for the value that you believe in. So this is how, in a very imperfect way, I would, I would answer your question. <laughs> Powerful. You know, it's just as short talks. I, I, to me, there's something about, again, authenticity. Huh? Again, standing true to what you believe in in the midst of the resistance you find when you're trying to drive change. And, and thank you for being that example for many of us as we seek to lead change. Huh? So thank you. Pauline, so so Pauline, as as we, you, so everyone here, I've worked with at some level or other, and so just as I as worked with Justice Short on a board, Pauline, it was as part of a leadership development program, and I was always so amazed at the again the exuberance, the brilliance, the sheer brilliance but also the willingness to work on self as part of her leadership. So again, I wasn't hesitating when I thought, hmm, she would be a wonderful example to include in the book. Huh? So, so Pauline, in the book, I share your journey to, to illustrate what self-acceptance is. As Raymond said, the first part of the book is around leading self. Huh? So I, I talk about self-acceptance particularly in your story about how you let go of perfectionism. And all of you high achievers, a perfectionist in the room, you can raise your hand. This is relevant to you all. You know yourselves, right? <laughs> okay. Pauline has a story for you. How you let go of perfectionism while remaining faithful to your commitment to excellence. Now, the issue of the imposter syndrome, again, I challenge anyone in this room who has not felt the imposter syndrome. The issue of the imposter syndrome and doubting yourself huh, is a common challenge I find for leaders. And I find young women might be more open about it, but the rest are feeling the same thing. They're just not saying it. Huh? Now, what strategies, Pauline, or advice would you share with us on how to build greater confidence as a leader. In other words, how do you lead from a space of deep worthiness while accepting yourself with all your imperfections? Thank you very much, Taka. Now, I have three key strategies, and these are based on my personal experience. But before I share these, I would like you to help me to thank Taka for taking me out of the abyss of perfectionism and helping me to embrace the power of my vulnerability. I could not be vulnerable. She made me vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> Please thank her for me. <laughs> and to give my three strategies, I would have to give you a background. Tak, I know there is no time, but please allow me. Thank you. So I got into the Africa Center for Energy Policy in 2016 as a policy analyst. And for the record, I am not a people pleaser, but I am a high achiever. And when I set my mind to things, when I picture what I want to get, it has to be exactly that. And that attitude propelled me quickly. I moved from a policy analyst. Within one year, I was a senior policy analyst. And then three months later, I was made the head of policy unit. At the time, my boss had had another opportunity, and I wasn't expecting to be the one to head the unit. So it was a very difficult moment for me, and that was the time Taka came in. It was very timely. Now, the reason I needed Taka are three. First, I had to fill in a very big shoe. My boss had his PhD, he's well known in Ghana, he knew his subject matter. And this is me, tiny Pauline. I was just following his lead at the office. I now had to lead everybody else, fill his shoes. It was a very difficult moment. Second, I had to lead my own peers. I came to meet them in ASAP. 
propelled upwards, and now I am their leader. They have seen me grow to become their leader. I couldn't be anything but perfect. And then the third thing is so simple. I just wasn't ready. I did not think the board of ASAP was going to agree for me to be the head of policy. So these three combined with the trust my boss, Benjamin Boache, had in me. He gave me a lot of opportunities. That trust, I just couldn't break it. I couldn't make any mistake. So if I couldn't make mistakes, then my direct report couldn't make mistakes either. I set the bar so high, I criticized them on paper because I wouldn't do it in their face, but when they bring me their work, their red lines, and people were angry with me, but they couldn't tell me, and they wouldn't, I was hearing things about me, but you know, like it was, I wasn't happy. Then Taka came in and told me, hey, you have to change your ways. (laughs) But first, you have to work on yourself. So she put me to work, and I was committed to it. Now, the first strategy to coming out of perfectionism is understanding that I was worthy of my position. I was technically competent. That is why I was put there. Otherwise, another person would have been there. So I had to take inspiration from the trust that my boss gave me, the trust that the the board members of ASAP gave me, to trust myself to deliver. But that wasn't easy, because I knew I was technically competent, but I just couldn't lead my colleagues. So what was the next thing to do? So this leads me to the second strategy. It is to do the inner work. Nobody would do it for you. Taka told me, Pauline, you have demons in you, face them. So she exercised those demons out of me. I had to be humble and comply. And one of the things I found very difficult doing was telling Taka exactly how I felt. I spent the whole night thinking about how to tell Taka that this is what I feel, this is what I want. I would write it out and then practice it. So when I met you, Taka, and I was rattling everything, I practiced in the night. (laughs) So I started practicing vulnerability with Taka. And then she helped me to navigate my heart and my mind. And then I was able to identify how I could relate with my colleagues. Now, the other thing I had to do with, you know, this same strategy of working on myself was managing my strength. I realized that once I, I, I realized Once I'm able to do something, I feel you should be able to do it too because if we are all educated, you should be able to do it. So I was merciless on my colleagues. But (laughs) I learned that it's very important to manage my strength, project my strength, propel it in ways that empower than diminish. I was diminishing them. I now had to empower them with my strength. I don't know how I did it, but some way, somehow, I had to learn to be humble, listen to their perspective, share my perspective, find ways and means of correcting them in ways that do not offend. And sometimes I had to do the practice in the night for the morning. (laughs) It wasn't easy. (laughs) So that is the the second strategy. Now, the third strategy, which I found very, very helpful is that I, I learned to connect with my colleagues genuinely, from a very genuine place. And I did that for one purpose, to help them to feel valued. Because when you help your people to feel valued, they value you, they trust you, and then they move with you. So how did I connect with them to make them feel valued? First, I started listening to them more than I talked. At meetings, I let them lead. Taka gave me some tips. Sometimes I'm going into a meeting and then I'll call Taka and I'm like, what should I say? What should I do? And she'll go like, do A, B, C, and D. Then I'll go and do exactly that. So over time, I was learning the skill on how to listen to people more. And more importantly, taking their input. 
I don't take their input to make them just feel listened, but I help them to see that their inputs are actually being implemented. So if X is Miss A's idea, and we are implementing X, I make Miss A understand that this is your idea we are implementing. I'll give you an example. So there was a time that I realized for our unit, we needed to define our values, which this is something I also learned from Takes, um, from Takes mentorship. We define our values, our mission as a unit, and how all of the, and our behaviors, and how all of that fed into the organizational strategy. So my boss funded us to go somewhere. We had a retreat, and then everything we did came from my colleagues. And at the end of the day, whatever we put out fed into the organizational strategy, and it was theirs. And they felt so happy that they contributed to something so meaningful. It's so practical. That is, it's not just listening to them, but it is showing them that whatever your inputs are have been implemented, and this is the result of your effort. That is something that I am proud of, and I'm happy to share. And then the second thing I did was to give them responsibilities tell them I trust them to, to, to de, um, deliver their responsibility. But I didn't just give them any responsibility. Taka taught me how to clarify my expectations of them. I give you task, I tell you. First of all, before the expectations, whatever tasks I gave them, they were tasks that they had interest in and they had competence also in. So it gave them more bold bravery to do the work. And then I clarify the expectations. So at the end of the day, we are not at cross purposes on a task. And they come back, they deliver, and they know exactly. Oh, Taka. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll move on to the others. So the other strategy was empowering them to do their work and also being vulnerable, asking for help. I could never be vulnerable, like I said, but eventually I learned to ask for help, and they were happy to support me. And then one other thing I did was to learn how to manage conflict. I was able to, you know, resolve issues without necessarily having them escalate to the next level. So these are some of the strategies oh, that I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. <laughs> Sorry to have rushed you there. Okay. Thank you, Pauline. I didn't realize I was an exorcist as well. Eh? I will add that to my CV as well. <laughs> Exercising demons. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I, I'm really going to enjoy this moment because many of you know what this man does to me, right? Asks me all these tough questions on City FM. So finally, roles are changed. <laughs> Let me get myself ready. <clears throat> Bernard Avle. <laughs> so in fact, because Bernard has asked me so many questions on City FM over the years, I'm going to ask him two questions. <laughs> so Bernard, two things. Huh? In, in the book, I illustrate, I use your story to illustrate that being clear on your values is pivotal as a leader because this clarity informs the decisions you make and the way you lead others. Huh? And our values turn the focus inward. So we often have to retreat to that place to gauge whether we're still being true to ourselves and our calling. Eh? Now, Bernard, the difficulty I have found is that in Ghana, even though we're deeply religious people, we struggle to live the values we profess, particularly when it means going against the grain. Eh? As a journalist, you see so many leaders who claim one thing, but do another. What would you say to young leaders who see that those who live without integrity are actually succeeding? They're getting bigger jobs, bigger cars, bigger salaries, and they wonder, why should I live according to the values? That's question number one. You're remembering question number one. <laughs> the second question is a, is a quick one. Huh? When you see the state of Ghana today, what two leadership qualities do we need the most? Ah, I've got him well, well, eh? <laughs> Revenge! <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> Thank you. Taka, for some reason, I didn't know I was going to be on this panel. And, and I guess it's like, Raymond, this is like, you, you told me, but because I have such bad um, attention to it, whatever, I, I, did, I, I thought I was just coming to sit at the back. So, like, Raymond, this is the cliff. I have to fly. Um, thank you for the questions. Good to see a lot of people I know. Michael, Robert, uh, it's, uh, sorry, I'm, I just have to, I'm a genius. Yes, I have to greet people. Do. Esther, <laughs> Prof, it's good to see you. It's, it's great to be here. And uh, your, your first question is interesting because you're asking essentially how to build the inner core, how to build the inner core. I think um, my devotion three days ago, I, I was thinking about the difference, and, and, and I'm a Christian, so I was thinking about the difference between how God built and how Satan destroys, if you believe in that. So essentially, Satan destroys you from outside in. So he, and if you read the book of Job, he, what he did was he attacked what was his property, attacked his household, and then attacked the person. But then God works from your inside out, like what you said in the book. So I feel the, the, the issue with young people, whether you're a journalist or politician, is we don't spend enough time being under the radar. So, so I was talking to Albert Okran, I think last week, and he was talking about the iceberg principle where you have to be bigger underneath than you're bigger above. And I feel for effective leadership, whether it's leading Shiraz in a very precarious time or taking an organization like uh, ASEP, it has a lot to do with what you invest on the inside. Mm -hmm. What you invest on the inside. So what I say to young people is don't be in a hurry to come on the, the screen. So because I'm a journalist, I've been doing radio for since the year 2000. A lot of my mates want me to put them on air. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I say to them, media is value neutral. It can build or destroy. And I think it does the latter more quickly. So a lot of people, because they, they, people want to be exposed, they want to be seen, and that exposure can destroy if you haven't built the inner core value. Mm -hmm. So today I was, at a, I was moderating a function for engineers, and they were talking about the nexus between engineering, politics, and sustainability. And I asked them a question. I, I asked them, as engineers, do you have any lines that you would not allow a politician to make you cross in your canons as engineers? Because, oh, engineers are great, politicians are corrupt, everybody's saying that. So my question to them was, okay, if you're an engineer in the Ministry of Roads, are there certain lines for professional pride you will not cross? Because we also ask, have to ask ourselves those questions. So to answer your first question, if you don't spend enough time alone in obscurity, managing and learning how not to be noticed, how to be quiet, not to be seen, to be broke, but yet be honest, to walk, to work, to take... Kukus Echado always tells me he used to fold a newspaper in his back pocket and collect his salary in cash. And he used to call his boss Onyan Kupon because he was so poorly paid. I respect him a lot. So everybody has a journey. So my, my point is that the times of oblivion, the times of solitude are critical to building that core that core, that, because it's, it's, it's what, what you are inside that determines what you become when you are exposed. So I think for young people, I'll say to them, the fact that you are being seen or you are successful in the eyes of, because success is really fulfilling your purpose and carrying others along. Mm -hmm. So the fact that somebody has a bigger job or has a better pay doesn't necessarily make them successful. Mm -hmm. So if they came to me with that question, in a nutshell, this is what I'll say. Your second question is much tougher. You're asking the two most important. Because you say leadership is situational, I, I think I'll answer that question situationally. Because if you, if, if you were to be the guy taking over Google in the context of Silicon Valley, the two most important things you would need to be different from if you are taking over ASAP mm. as a lady within the time frame where she's coming. Or if you're leading um, Shraj in 93 where Rollins is, is, is not happy, you know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, for me, I, I think that the love thing is deep for me. The love thing is deep. And I think when Raymond was talking, I was writing. So, and I'm always ref, re, refining my notes. So, he says, leadership is grounded in doing the inner work that is necessary to become someone else people would want to follow. Mm. So, I think that the first thing is the willingness to pay the price. The willingness, because, you know, 
even if you are a journalist who criticizes, there's still a price to pay for it. Mm. Even if you're, even if, so no serious leader gets, whether it's a position or influence, leadership is not cheap. Yeah. So the most important quality you will see in my little life, whichever area, you have to be prepared to pay the price. Now, you can't be prepared to pay the price if you haven't counted the cost. Do you understand me? So the, 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 the second must come first in a very weird way. So you have to count the cost. So people say, ah, you are such, I love you. You are such a great journalist. Well, I tell them, well, I see my family Friday, Saturday, Sunday for 17 years. So Saturdays, I don't go anywhere. I have to stay home and just help them do homework. But you have to count the cost. So, or you are somebody of values. You want to enter a field like politics. You don't enter politics because people say you are eloquent and you speak well. You know, for which of you intending to build a house that's not set out to count the cost? So for me, to, to take over Shraj in 93, do you understand? To, to set it up in a way that will be built in your image for all of it. You have to. It's a price because you have a private guy. You have your music thingy. You are happy. Nobody's harassing you. Now you come on there, some pesky, pesky journalists asking you so many questions, you know. So I think for me, I'll give a generic answer. Count the cost. Count the cost because it's expensive to be a leader in the sense that it will cost you something. Mm. Then, having counted the cost, if you are wise, if you can't pay the price, you back off. Mm. Because that's where the imposter issue comes in. Mm. Because then, if you, if you count the cost, for example, people say to me, oh, why don't you go into politics? You, 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 you have so many people. I said, even the little cost I've counted, I don't even think I've developed the inner strength to survive. I don't think I have, and I have to be honest with myself, do you understand? Because even as a journalist, so it's not like, so even though we criticize politicians, for somebody to say, I want to go out there to lead people, yeah, so it's not like we are the best guys. If in counting the cost, then you decide, do I want to pay this price? So I would say to be an effective leader, you must count the cost and be willing to pay the price. So that, that's my long answer for your short question. Oh, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so dear friends and colleagues, you see now why I, I captured their wonderful and powerful stories. Thank you all so much. I would have loved to have continued the conversation, but the night is getting late, so I want to, to thank you. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Huh? Thank you all so much. Eh? Back to you, Axel.